For being here, I'm very excited uh, to be back at Bowling Green. It's always a, a pleasure to come here and to feel Ray's spirit and to see all the great things that are going on and, and especially to see all these great grad students who are pursuing pop culture. Uh, it's a wonderful place to be. So today I'm going to talk about uh, a number of things. I've titled this presentation Magic Threads, Talking Heads, Big Brands, and Difficult Questions or Storytelling in an Age of Uncertainty. So in 1961, fresh off the success of Rabbit Run, John Updike found himself in an unfamiliar place, an existential crisis leading to near inability to write. At the time, he explained, quote, my wit seemed sunk in a bog of anxiety, and my customary doubts that I could write another word appeared unusually well justified. To break himself out of this funk, Updike wrote two stories that were essentially montage, packing a number of ideas into each piece, quite unlike the mannered, revelatory short stories he usually published in The New Yorker. He titled the first, the Blessed Man of Boston, My Grandmother's Thimble and Fanning Island. The second, Pack Dirt, Church Going, A Dying Cat, A Traded Car. These are stories that would rejuvenate Updike. He filled them with ruminations about faith, family, long automobile trips, and escape, even if temporarily, from adult responsibilities. As with so much Updike, there is sex, adulterous longings, and what it all means. These stories fill the gap between Rabbit Run and his mega blockbuster Couples, published in 1968, which would make Updike a controversial household name and land him on the cover of Time magazine. Now, I tell this brief story of Updike not to highlight the notion that even our greatest writers suffer crises of confidence or dreaded writer's block, but rather to demonstrate how the focus on storytelling and narrative helps us collectively make sense of our complex culture, and perhaps more importantly, our individual place in that culture. I'd also like to extol the virtues of montage, which I'll now present in an earnest attempt at provoking, extolling, challenging, and engaging with you all this morning. When I think about the state of pop culture in contemporary society, I mirror Updike's funk. So perhaps together we can come up with some answers that will lighten my mood. Certainly a number of sessions at this conference hold that promise. On to magic threads. Examining the title of this conference, Clash and Convergence, Explorations of Culture in an Age of Uncertainty, my mind leaps to ways one might bridge these competing influences, clash and convergence. Immediately I leap to the notion of storytelling. As a matter of fact, I think storytelling and narrative serve as the magic thread that holds popular culture together. Across mass media, politics, sports, consumer culture, and the capitalist system, storytelling and narrative are the foundational tools employed to achieve some end. Whether it's Coca-Cola employing a post-colonial commercial to sell more fizzy brown water, or politicians selling the idea that higher education is only beneficial if it leads directly to jobs, or at least job skills. As in so many areas, Facebook's an interesting case study in storytelling. On one hand, the site provides each of us with more or less our own entertainment network, while at the same time, corporations and other organizations are increasingly employing the site to market to consumers who have haplessly signed over the rights to their personal information in return. Technology is enabling organizations to create a closer bond to consumers via storytelling as if each product or service has some intimate tie to one's life that is just longing to be told. As always, in attempting to figure out the broader meaning, I turn to my defining question, WWRBD, what would Ray Brown do? <laughs> For Ray, the story that he told was simple, yet given the times, fraught with personal and professional challenges, why popular culture matters. I think I may have uncovered Ray's most direct definition of popular culture in Symbiosis, Popular Culture and Other Fields, which was published in 1988, which he co-edited with his uh, oft co-editor, Marshall Fishwick. Quote, people equal cultures, end quote. 
Given Ray's work establishing popular culture in academe, I think we now need to turn to him again for a different reason. In addition to defining popular culture, Brown also provided scholars with a method of inquiry. In my mind, this is the way we should employ Ray's thinking today. He showed us the magic in the magic thread. While other scholarly disciplines return again and again to their intellectual leaders, for example, literacy scholars and Maxine Green, or curriculum theorists to John Dewey, popular culture scholars have not kept Brown in the forefront, even though his thinking tells us not just what popular culture is, arguably less important today, but how we examine the field theoretically. Brown, for his part, is clear that popular culture scholars should be open to a myriad of theories and methodologies. In his famous essay, The Theory Methodological Complex, he explains, quote, not basing our whole point of view and theory and methodology on one approach, we can more easily shift gears and see other points of approach and view, end quote. Clearly, this is not anti-theory, but all-inclusive and reliant, and not reliant on the latest fads. Instead, the researcher should employ the tools needed to complete a job, pulling from disciplines that make sense to the project. Brown's even more clear, even more direct in clearing the path in symbiosis. Quote, the popular culture approach is the omni and humanistic approach. The popular culture scholar and critic realizes that the most valid results of his or her investigation can be achieved if the critic mixes all the theories and methodologies of other disciplines using as much or little as needed to see the phenomena from all sides and through all dimensions. The most nearly comprehensive analysis then is that omni-humanistic investigation that is as broad as possible. Despite Brown's influence on popular culture studies, for those of us here and around the globe who recognize his importance, my concern is that Brown's work is not properly acknowledged or cited in most popular culture readers currently on the market. He's viewed as a popularizer of pop popular culture rather than one of its intellectual guides. For example, neither the second volume, second edition of Marcel Denise's Popular Culture Inter Introductory Perspectives, published by Roman and Littlefield in 2012, nor Leroy Ashby's Mammoth 712 page with Amusement for All, A History of American Popular Culture Since 1830, University of Kentucky 2006, reference Brown et al. Certainly individuals who knew Brown and the many academics that studied him have kept his memory alive. Here at Bowling Green, at this conference, via the Pop Culture Association, the regional meetings. In my own case, I think Gary Hoppenstand and Kathy Murlock Jackson are sick of me asking questions about what it was like to study with Ray Brown <laughs> and what it was like to work with him. In fact, when they see me coming, they hit, hit, the, hit the bricks and run the other way. <laughs> the sad fact, however, is that many popular culture study scholars, and particularly young scholars, are not engaging with him intellectually. Ray gave popular culture scholars the keys to the kingdom, but we have essentially turned our backs on him as our intellectual guide. On to talking heads. I draw once again from the call for papers of this conference, highlighting the, quote, institutional forms which academe, academic spaces take, and, quote, our role as scholar activists. For me, the notion of becoming a scholar activist is akin to serving as a public intellectual, even though that label is more or less out of favor. At the heart of the public intellectual journey is courage, from assuming a willingness to put oneself in the public spotlight to being tough enough to weather possible criticism as a result. Given that our strengths are in research, writing, and presenting ideas, we should play to those talents in a courageous manner, providing context, critical analysis, and sound reasoning on issues that establish the public agenda. <coughs> While the payoff may seem distant if measured against traditional academic success markers, as scholars, I argue we have a moral obligation to use our skills and abilities to improve the world. Yet there's also a real rubber-meets-the-road risk involved with such a stance that encompasses the ideal state versus reality. If you're lucky enough to win the tenure-track lottery, tenure considerations are real. And 
that is a big challenge for people who want to step into the public arena. Because if what counts isn't anything related to public service or public intellectualism, then you're shooting yourself in your foot by, by stepping out in this manner. It's also a challenge because we live in an ever-increasingly anti-intellectual environment. And so politicians, particularly local politicians, the great Babbitts of our age, are looking for reasons to shoot down us leftist, liberal, uh, little working professors. The institutions that we teach in and that we go to school in are targets. And as such, we are targets. Uh, you can see this happening all over the, the country. If you read the Chronicle of Education or Inside Higher Ed, you stay up to speed. Yet despite these challenges, I do believe that we have an obligation. And as I myself move from the kind of youngish scholar to kind of oldish scholar, I plan to be more out front in terms of public intellectualism. And I hope that collectively we can make this change and make what counts in our, in our promotion and tenure committees actually mean something to the rest of the world. Too often, and as, as a journal editor and a book editor, I have friends and colleagues who once they get tenure come up to me and say, well, now I can do what I want to do. And that almost brings tears to my eyes. It's perhaps the saddest thing I ever hear. I had to do these things to get tenure now six or eight whatever years into their career after six or eight years of graduate school. So almost 20, 15 to 20 years later, you can finally do what you want to do. All because of this draconian system that uh, outlives its usefulness. On to big brands. One of the most consistently perplexing aspects of popular culture to me is consumerism and capitalism. Perhaps my discomfort is derived from a decade spent working in corporate communications essentially creating the internal culture that enabled organizations to thrive and then working externally to develop strategic plans to get people's money out of their pockets. Believe me, I'm still trying to cleanse my soul from that decade in the <laughs> corporate world. As a result, I feel the popular culture and consumerism tie as intimately as the air I breathe and the ground that I walk on. It's convinced me that we're living in an environment similar to the early days of radio and television, the sponsors are running entertainment, news, sports, and other programming simply to, put a, to provide a rationale for selling things. For those of you who are parents, have been parents, you'll feel my pain. I feel this most acutely with my eight-year-old daughter, whose entire life has been a parade of brands battling for her soul. Given what I've just confessed, I see a genuine need for popular culture scholars to conduct economic and business-based research that answers the call for this conference, to be critical of the culture around us. Our engagement with brands is a key factor here. Watching the tween nightmares on the Disney Channel or Hub Network, where young viewers can learn firsthand how to get ahead by putting others down, how to rely on friends for creating one's opinion, or how important fashion and looks should be, sends me into a lather. And it should send us all into a lather. Um, my daughter thinks I'm draconian for my stance against these programs, but so be it. Another example is the entire HGTV network, and it's many imitators, <laughs> where viewers can obsess about wealth and status around the clock, whether one is a property version or obscenely wealthy American looking for a McMansion on an impoverished Caribbean island. Heck, even my daughter knows, eight years old, whether a house costs 400000 or over a million, the first thing that you do when you buy that house is gut the kitchen. <laughs> Countertops are not acceptable if they're not granite or marble. This is 21st century America, for God's sake. Nothing worse than an outdated kitchen. <laughs> On to difficult questions. Now I'm going to ask a question that might be the most controversial of all particularly on Ray Brown's stomping grounds and the traditional home of popular culture studies in America. So Ray, if your spirit's in the room, please know I raise this point with the utmost respect. Is popular culture evil? Some of you may hear this question as a natural consequence of the doomy, gloomy portrait I have presented. But there's actually a ray of hope. If we're not willing to address these kinds of dif difficult questions, who is? 
I think it's difficult to argue that a vast majority of popular culture is corporate driven and essentially a means of diverting attention from the challenges humanity faces. I think we have an obligation to serve as scholar activists, which I mentioned earlier, as the forces of intellectualism, anti-intellectualism and anti-critical thinking a mass power. These are long-term challenges that we can only battle together. As scholars, we may understand or feel the, quote, panic that Henry Jenkins addresses, but Costco and Walmart parking, parking lots are still overfilled every Saturday afternoon of the year as the public goes on gorging itself. There seems to be an enormous disconnect between regular people, regular people, and the marketers and corporations urging them to gorge themselves on consumer goods. So it goes beyond corporate media power to a world in which corporate power increases with the media as its salesman, marketer, and mouthpiece. Popular culture is the bridge. Obviously, technology is changing the kind of storytelling that takes place. Thus, the concern Jenkins expresses regarding the, quote, anxieties and uncertainties, even panic as people imagine a world without gatekeepers and live with the reality of expanding corporate media power. In the eight years since Jenkins made this statement, I would argue that he got it half right. Rather than fear a world without gatekeepers, people have thrived. Yet at the same time, corporate power has expanded ex exponentially, even contracting in an era that is defined by the handful of monopolies that control the media. There used to be, say, eight companies that controlled all the media in the world. Now it's down to five, and it's shrinking every day. My own ideas about storytelling encompass my intellectual growth as a biographer, a cultural historian, and editor of other people's work. Recently, reading How Literature Saved My Life by David Shields, I came across a passage that seems to lay it all out pretty well, even though it's pretty messy in reality. Shields says, quote, reality isn't straightforward or easily accessible. It's slippery, evasive. Just as authorship is ambiguous, knowledge is dubious, and truth is unknown, or at the very least, relative. My story today has been one of questioning the world around us, which as Shield, Shields opines is ambiguous and relative. Yet I'm confident enough to assert that we popular culture scholars have a significant role in interrogating culture and its consequences. And I will throw one commercial of my own into this mix to, to leave you with. For those of you who are going to the Popular Culture Association meeting in Chicago this spring, um, I'm chairing a panel. Uh, the panel is called Why Ray Brown Matters. It's a special session um, that's going to get some publicity. The panelists are Colin Hell, Paul Booth, myself, Gary Hoppenstan is going to serve as a panelist, and Gary Burns is going to be our respondent. So we have quite a all those guys are pretty much stars. I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm, just, I'm just the guy who came up with the idea. But they're, they're great people, and this is, uh, I've heard from a lot of people who are excited about the, the, the session, and uh, I think the attendance is going to be pretty, pretty high. It's going to be on Thursday afternoon at 3. So that's my talk. I'd love to talk more uh, questions, whatever you'd like to do from this point on. We have, we have plenty of time, I think. Okay, thank you. Definitive influences. 
I was raised in a single family home by a very poor mother, and so dreaming was all, all I really had. Um, and that's kind of stuck with me. And as I've pursued cultures, cultural studies and popular culture as an intellectual engagement, as, as my passion for writing and expressing myself, um, I teach communications, both mass communications and specifically public relations classes. And so I see the way that marketers use popular culture to sell products. But then when I'm sitting in a room full of students, they have very specific pre-professional ideas and um, training that, that goes on. So what I do in the evenings and the mornings, writing and thinking about pop culture, kind of shifts a little bit and becomes more realistic for my students in the ways that they need to be trained. And rather than go teach an American Studies program or teach in an English program, um, I decided to stay with communications and, pop and public relations because uh, I saw firsthand the evils of public relations and marketing. And I thought, if I can just be a Johnny Appleseed of ethic be ethical behavior and kind of moral behavior to my students, then I'll have done more good than teaching an you know, a English survey of 20th century novel or something like that. Even though I think that's incredibly, immensely important, um, public relations students and communication students are going to, I tell them all the time, they're you're going to become creators. Not only are you consumers of popular culture and culture, but you're going to create that culture. And so I try to teach them to do it ethically. So I think that help. Yes, it does. Yeah. Dr. Rachel, thank you so much for your remarks. Um, thank you. I was wondering, you mentioned uh, sort of the, the tensions that particularly early scholars find themselves in, uh, in what we might call the tenure thread. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you provided a start to an answer to this question, but I wonder uh, what thoughts you have for those of us who are heading into that uh, reality as to how to negotiate the balance of uh, you know, the, the desire to, uh, to invoke change and at the same time keep our hands above the line. Yeah, that's a great question. I don't think I have the answer. I think, you know, collectively, we all need to be thinking about this a lot more. Um, Look, it affects me. It affects every. It affects everybody. Um, I often think that if you know, if if I just would have called myself a critical cultural scholar or something or a cultural historian from the beginning, I'd probably be be better off than I am right now. I mean, you get that residual effect even by aligning yourself with popular culture, because. It gives people power in academe to keep other people down or keep other fields down. It's a big, it's a big, big challenge. To tell you the truth, if you're lucky enough to win the the, the tenure track sweepstakes, then you should do whatever it is necessary to achieve tenure. That's just factual and realistic. Um, I used to teach at a, at a big research school and I had doctoral students and they would have stars in their eyes because you know we, they'd be reading my books and things like that and, and I, the first thing that I would do when I, they sat down in my office is say, I, say, I would say, I'll help you any way that I can. I'll, I'll get you published, I'll network for you, I'll help you learn, but do not use me as a role model. Because I'm the kind of person I like to a lot of people see a hornet's nest and they walk away. I like to walk right up and kick it and see what happens. <laughs> and so my career has been all over the place. And so I'm not a role model for this, but I am an advocate for changing the system. Um, I have a graduate student who created a, a video, a little documentary. That, that video that she created has over 25,000 views on YouTube. It's, she's been cited for that video. Now, she may never in her career doing kind of traditional communication studies stuff ever reach that kind of readership. But she does it with one video when she's in grad school. To me, it's just it completely illogical that we don't recognize that what we do has purpose outside of, you know, if they're going to take 
you know, the fact that we want to teach liberal arts stuff to our students. If they're going to take that away from us, and what we do outside the classroom doesn't count, why the hell would anybody want to do this career? It's, it's insane. You could make more money being a manager of CVS. <laughs> so, you know, we have to change it, but it's going to take collective action on the part of senior scholars. You know, and some senior scholars are, are very much active and scholar activists. Other senior scholars, they're happy with what they've achieved and they're perfectly willing to lock the door behind them as they, you know, continue down their path. So th there are a lot of challenges. Hopefully that helps a bit. I don't know if I, I would say do whatever it takes to get tenure because it, it may not be right, but it's going to give you security and the freedom to do the things that you need to do. Do you think it ever will be possible to be able to publish something that's a a more popular, less critical text and not be looked down upon in academia? Yes, it depends where you are. Mm -hmm. it, just, it really does. It depends on the school you're at. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it changes all the time. You, you can prove, uh, I have a friend who's going up for full professor. She has to prove that Prager is an academic enough press. Mm -hmm. Now, I could give you a list, and I've created this list. There are distinguished university professors at the best schools in the world that have published with Prager. Mm -hmm. Now, that should be enough. She, she can provide sales figures, and I know the way Prager operates, their sales are pretty good. One, you know, a, a kind of a typical Prager book will sell five to ten times more than any university press book. And so a lot of it depends just where you're at. And um, that's why collectively we all need to work toward uh, addressing and changing what counts and what's considered scholarship. Uh, but I think people do it now. You know, the, I, the books that I have written, they count. You know, so there are always going to be naysayers, but there would be naysayers if I were doing, you know, quant studies too. You know, it's the great thing, it's the sad thing about being an academic. We're trained to be critical. And so our first, you know, it's like, you know, I used to go to my grandfather, anything I asked him, the answer was no. <laughs> it's the same thing in any time you deal with academics. You know? Why, is it, why haven't you quoted Foucault seven times, you know? It's just crazy, you know? Because Foucault's not pertinent, you know? People are always t saying, you know, pe people have said to me, well, why aren't, you know, why aren't you employing this theory? I'm like, hey, I'm starting my own damn theory. You know, I've got my own, I don't need, I don't need uh, to quote people just to get my kicks. I create my own. You know, I'm a smart guy, I'll create my own theory. So, uh, I think it is happening. I mean, a, lot, a lot just depends on the school you're at. You uh, started out talking about um, going back and looking at some of Ray Brown's um, theories, you know, like that term. Um, can you talk a little bit about what directions you would, you would see that people could go back and pick up those threads? Yeah, I do quite a bit of uh, I have a whole Ray Brown bookshelf, and you know I feel kind of like my entire career is indebted to him. So I feel I feel personally responsible for you know keeping him alive as much as I can with with everybody else that does. <coughs> if we're going to look back on our intellectual forebears, like they do in other fields, I think you know we should all be mining Ray's work. For that theoretical, he, I don't think he didn't like the word, and I don't think, but he wasn't. People, people take that notion and say Ray Brown was anti-theory. He was not anti-theory. He just didn't like people who relied on fads to promote their work. Like, so in graduate school, I had a professor who said, "You need to find a theorist to um, hinge your work on." So it was like, find the theorist, then create the project. That would have made Ray Brown 
kick himself, kick someone. <laughs> that, that drove him crazy. He was an anti-theory, and he knew all. He knew, he knew everything. The guy was brilliant. He, you know, he read it all. He just didn't like the facts. Scholars jumping from one fad to another. And if you think about the era in which he was doing this, particularly as he really came into big power in the in the 80s and, and 90s, this was in an era where faddish theory came, became the norm. What I think Ray does for us theoretically is gives power to our interdisciplinarity. And that's really, I think, important. Um, how, personally, I dabble in, I don't do dabble, I read thoroughly. I read a ton of sociology. I read a ton of, there, there's a new form of history that's popular now called big history. It's like the rebirth of universal history. I've read everything and I'm organizing in those, you know, I'm in those organizations to kind of be a Pied Piper for pop culture and to keep these people thinking about the important role of culture as they create uh, new ideas. So I think what Ray, I think Ray blesses us for our interdisciplinarity. And I think that's incredibly important. The world, just as the, the media world is contracting and becoming slimmer, the, the, the idea that a scholar is only valuable or important if they're an inch wide and a mile deep, to me, is exactly the wrong way to think about it. And I think Ray points us to that. Let's, let's pull in what we need, be interdisciplinary, and use that and be proud of that. So I, I think that's, that's what we can, we can pull from Ray. And I think we need more. You know, Ben, ben Urish's edited collection is a good start, but it's just reprinting what Ray said. We need more, like, <clears throat> What Ray was, what what he meant, how we can use it. We need, you know, he needs to be woven into the historiography of our field. Um, well, I come from China, Beijing, and I would like to, to share something, some situation about cultural studies in China. Uh, actually, this year's uh, cultural diplomacy. Well, the inter international communication of culture is very popular in China because we face a problem now. Because uh, actually two years ago, China China's government has made a documentary which costs lots of money, and this uh, this documentary is about Chinese culture. And then this documentary is uh, is like a. Uh, uh, um, was broadcasted in New York, New York, uh, the most popular place. The, it, it is located in a place where uh, where every people can watch. Well, however, how about the effect? It's no, because nobody noticed, nobody understands uh, what does the document we're talking about. However, in China, most Chinese people will search on the internet for the most popular uh, American soap operas, Super Girls, yes, yeah, this is uh, very popular, yes. So we face this kind of problem. So I would like you to talk about uh, what the challenge in this uncertainty of age, uh, if we would like to do the inter uh, international communication of culture. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. The challenge from your perspective as a Chinese scholar? Well, okay. Uh, uh, maybe for every country. For every <laughs> <laughs> well, the problem with the world. Uh, yeah. Well, I think uh, I don't. I don't even. I'm not, I'm not even sure how to begin that. Uh, I think that we need to be more inclusive. Uh, Ray was moving quite a bit towards international and did so much in terms of, of trying to move popular culture out of just American-centric into other cultures. And I think that he would be a great guide for scholars all over the world to, to use as, as an intellectual um, foundation. So uh, 
I think from what I've worked with quite a few Chinese students, um, and the challenges I think are that with with hyper capitalism as it's plowed through China, there are a lot of pieces that are being left behind. So culture, I think, is one of them. And rather than just looking to American culture like two broke girls and being fans of that culture, I think what we what we need to develop is a compare and contrast situation where global scholars are looking at American culture and vice versa from a critical perspective rather than just a celebratory perspective. And because I think that's part of the reason why even other scholars in the United States, when they're looking at somebody's work, they have a problem with it because they think, well, you're just a fan of that thing. Like, I'm a fan of a movie, so I want to write about it. Now, that may be true, but I am certainly, and we all as scholars, are intelligent and thoughtful enough to also be critical of our the things that we enjoy, in addition to just, you know, championing them as... Uh, pieces of, of culture. However, in China, the thing culture study is regarded a uh, low standard uh, in academic field because Chinese scholars, they are not too open to accept cultural study. But I think co uh, pop popular culture is the most easy way to let more people understand visual communication, audio communication, that is the easiest way to accept. Yeah, in terms of, um, you know, I've worked with a lot of Chinese students who um, came to the United States to study public relations because public relations scholarship really doesn't exist in China. So they come here because, because of capitalism, they need to understand how to do marketing better. Uh, the challenge is, um, from that perspective, they go back into a situation that is more conservative, you know, government control. So it may take some time, it not may, it will take some time for cultural studies or pop culture to gain any kind of footing in China because you have this country moving ahead at warp speed and essentially leading the, the globe in capitalism and economics, but so much has been left behind. It's like this giant sun streaking through the sky. Well, there's things that, you know, the sun can't encompass everything, and in this vortex, all this other stuff's coming. And I think that pop culture and cultural studies is going to be part of that. It's going to take some time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. We have like a minute or two left if anybody else has a final comment or a question. I have a question I'm trying to formulate, but I'm not, not sure you have time to answer. Pedagogically, I was trying to think about how to apply what you were talking about with regards to being people who can speak to a larger audience and not just in the echo chamber of whatever your discipline is. But how do we do that given all the pressures that if you're trying to teach a gen ed course? How do you incorporate any critical theory, especially with the various pressures you get to try to incorporate so much of it. No, it's a great question. Uh, this depends on the situation. You're in. I mean, if somebody's given you a blueprint of a course that you have to cover A through Z, I mean, that's a challenge. But if you have some, uh, you know, there I try to draw from good popular media. You know, there are great pieces in the Atlantic. There's, you know, good pieces in Time every now and then. Draw from things from the internet that maybe we could pull in some of this without making it too heavy-handed. Mm -hmm. I mean, my my students can't handle too much theory. Yeah. They just it's it's beyond them at some point. So you know, instead of bashing them over the head with it, I may, I do say to myself, well, if I can increase their, either their contextual thinking or their critical thinking, and slip some of this in, then maybe I've done my job. Um, but it is a challenge. It's, uh, 
you know, it's it's the damn standardized management regime regime that we live in now. You know, we're we're turning out people who don't have the capacity for critical thinking, and we're that's gonna it's gonna bite us someday. <laughs> you know, so we're just like the kind of the last stand against that. And I think we fight that in our classrooms, and and we'll continue to fight that. Eventually, we're going to be overpowered. It's like that zombie scene from World War Z, <laughs> where the zombies pile up and they eventually take over Israel. I think it was. That's that's like standardized management. What's going to do to the rest of us? <laughs> Perfect visual for it. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everybody.